Now, whenever we estimate models, what I've done so far is just to print the output of that model. But in practice, there's much more information in here. So the model object is a list of these 14 elements here, contains the coefficient, the estimate of sigma square, and the mask for the parameters, the log likelihood, the AIC value, which model we're looking at, all the residuals, and so forth. And if we want to get a little bit more insight to it, we can also look at STR of the object. And then we can indeed see the coefficients up here that we estimated with their corresponding names. Spend some time looking at this example if you have it. Um, but it means that we can easily do a log likelihood test. So we had the ARMA 2,1 model versus the ARMA 3,1 model. What is the difference in likelihood? Well, the difference is 50. That's a big difference in that world. But what we have to look up, we have to look at the chi-square distribution. And the test statistic is minus 2 times the difference in log likelihood. And we have to compare it with distribution with the number of degrees of freedom equal to the number of parameters that are different. So we have one parameter difference in this case. The probability that we get out here of being below this is a 1. So what we're looking at is a cumulative distribution function some shape, and then it converges to a 1 here. And now what we're asking for is to say what is, looking at this quantile here, what is the value that we get there? When we get close to 1 there, we get numerical issues. So well, and what we care about is not what we have to the left, what we care about is what we have to the right. We want the upper tail, so to speak. So instead of calculating 1 minus 1 equals to 0, what we could do is to use the cumulative distribution function for the chi-square function, and then specifying everything as above, but say lower, fall, lower tail equals false instead of true, which is the default. Then we get a p-value here, that is 10 to the minus 23rd. So in practice, it's zero, but it's never true zero. So consider whether you want the upper or lower tail whenever you're using these distribution functions. It's much better to use lower tail equals false than to say 1 minus the lower tail. To do the S-test, we can take the sum of the residual square for the two models. First one has four parameters, second one has five parameters, and then we can calculate the usual F statistic, get 123. It's the difference in the sum of squares divided by the difference in number of parameters, normed by the sum of squared residuals divided by the number of elements in that sum, or degrees of freedom for that. Then we have to look it up in the F distribution, the statistic, the two different degrees of freedom, and again, I will use the lower tail equals false argument out here to get it all in one go. Again, I get a p-value that is 10 to the minus 23rd. So it's not exactly numerically the same, but we are out there where it really doesn't matter. It's so significant. As the last example, I'll take some data that I just didn't just simulate so you cannot see what they are. But I will plot what they are. And you can see, well, it's just stationary process. We have some information in the autocorrelation function up to, actually, there's something here in lag 7 that may or may not be noise. Also, in the partial autocorrelation function, there's quite a lot of signal there. So it's kind of hard to say which model is actually the appropriate one use in this case. So I will just, in the interest of time, skip the first steps in selection and do an ARMA 2,2 model. 
and just see what it resulted in. So as you can see it, we see that this parameter is greater than two times the standard error, and the same thing appli applies to all of them. The least significant is the AR2 parameter. Let's look at the residual plots from this model. We still have some information up to like, actually like eight now in the partial autocollation function, so we are definitely not done yet, but it's very difficult to see what is actually the right op optimal next step to do. You can say that there's something in the ACF, something in the partial ACF, so we cannot say. Now I will just do an experiment where what I do is first to estimate an ARMA 2,4 model and then an ARMA 4,2 model. Let me just show the output of it as well. So that was the 2,4 model. Let's look at a diagnostic plot for this one. It did help. We still have some stuff left in the partial autocollation function, but look, the numbers here are not so big anymore. Now let's do the ARMA 4,2 model. And the diagnostic plot for this one, it sure did help a lot in the ACF. And likewise, in the partial autocollation function, there's nothing there. And now the young box statistic is also saying that we can actually confirm this is white noise. And if we look at the AIC values, we cannot use the likelihood directly here because they're not nested. Same story as before. But looking at the AIC, we also have a much smaller A AIC for the ARMA 4,2 model than we had for the ARMA 2,4 model up here. So we will say that the right model is this model up here. Let me skip that one there. Now, that was about finding models. And I know I've been skipping some steps, but and sometimes there's no unique way to find the optimal model. You just have to try a number of models. Sometimes you can do brute force methods and try a lot of models and figure out which one is the best. One important thing is to go before doing too much testing, you want to go to a high enough order to make sure that you kind of get the correlation structure somewhat resolved. Don't expect for real data to have pure white, no to have something that is as beautiful as this, but do make sure that you have something where you have do not have too much information. If the young box test statistic is well behaved, you can say then all the other test statistics that we usually do for testing parameter values are typically also well behaved, even if things are not completely white. They are reasonably robust. It just means that the 5% level may become, say, a 6 or 8% level, or maybe a 2% level. But when you have something that is very significant, it will remain very significant. But that was assuming white noise. And of course, we should also look at the distribution assumption, not just the ACF and correlation structure. So let's do some plots. First, just look at a histogram and the theoretical curve there. It's not the most in informative plot, but it's nice to just have a look at. What I think is more informative is to look at the QQ plot with a QQ line in the top. And in this case, it's very beautiful, actually more beautiful than you should expect. But sometimes you're lucky, so enjoy that. Just for curiosity, let's just plot these are actually the residuals, and now if we just simulate some uh, a wide noise process, well, we can also see that that's the same. You can do this kind of a volley plot where you just plot, a but I mean, do that not in the report, but do that for your own sake sometimes. Plot some wide noise signals just to see how they should look like, so you get a feeling for what they are. In this case, I mean, the time series is so long that even when you zoom out, show the whole thing here, well, you can still not distinguish the actual 
observation one by one. It's just a lot of nice, which is fine, which is what we want. One of the things we talked about in the previous lecture was the scientist. So in this case, we have n residuals, which means that we have n minus one half. And that's the expected number of sign changes. And the standard error of that, well, that's in a binomial distribution. That's n times p, uh, the variance is n times p times one minus p. So that's, in this case, n is n minus one. And then p is one half. And that means also 1 minus p is 1 half. So that means we just divide by 4. So we get a 95% confidence interval to have between 816 and 983 changes. So how many do we have? Let's just store the residuals in a vector called res. And then how I find the number is by taking all but the first multiply that by all but the last uh, residual. So I take the series and shift it one lag here. Then when I multiply these together, if the sign is the same of both numbers, then it did not change. If they are negative, then they have the opposite signs. So I count how many of those have a change in sign. And I get 885, which is well uh, nicely in the middle of this. Rather than doing, you can say, your confidence interval yourself by doing the normal approximation, you can also use the binome.test function to do it in the appropriate binomial distribution. In this case, the number of observations is so large that the normal approximation is very, very good. Again, you need the number of sign changes and you need the number of potential changes here. And all we get is that we got a probability of success of 0.49. It's just dividing the two numbers. And then we get a 95% confidence interval for that. And that includes 0.5. And thus, we can not reject that they're independent by this measure. We already did the young box test as part of our regular plotting, but here's just a different way of doing it all manually. So we take the autocollation function, that argument, if we don't plot it, then what we get out is a vector of number of, of all the autocollations. And then what I also did at the end there is I omitted the first one and took the following 14 numbers. The first one is per definition 1 because that's like 0. And then what I want to do is I want to make the sum of squares residuals here. And when I, to get the test statistic, I also have to multiply by the number of residuals. So I get 5.4-ish, and I have to look that up again in a chi-square distribution, the test statistic, and I have to look at how many coefficients are there in the model. No, sorry, how many autocollation function uh, lags did I include in my autocollation function calculation, and how many coefficients do I have in my model? So that's the one thing that is not in the young box test I did by plotting it before. It did not include or correct for the number of parameters in the model, but that I can do now. In this case, I did it 1 minus the p chi-square. I can, of course, again, do the lower tail equals false argument. In this case, since we are very far from 0, we cannot see the difference between the two, but it's just to underline, it's always better to do this. Now, let's just look at the parameters that we estimated here. We can do the quick brute force test of significance. First, saying that the, let's start from one end for the autoregressive parameter here, 0.49 is much greater than 2 times 0.06. Almost similar for the AR2 model. 
and AR3 is also mu much greater than a factor of 2. On the AR4, there you also have that the estimate is much greater than two times the standard error. Same thing applies to the MA1 and the MA2. So none of the parameter estimates are close to be uh, insignificant. So as such, we are happy. Now, what we will also do is to look at the cumulative periodogram. First, just for the data, just to see what it looks like. And then we will do it for the residual as well, and see that for the data, what we have, have an over-representation of some higher frequencies, whereas for the residuals, everything is well within the confidence interval. Just for curiosity, we'll test a single parameter. So, in this case, we have six parameters. So, what we have to look at, we have, picked, have to pick one. Let's just pick the MA1 parameter, which is the least significant one. We look at the ratio of the estimate over the standard deviation, and we know that we have n minus p degrees of freedom. And again, we will ex look at the upper tail. We multiply it by two in order to do not a one-sided test, but a two-sided test. So we have the probability of being not just in the greater tail, but also in the lower tail to treat those equally. Now, so see what we get. We get a rather small p-value, 3 times 10 to the minus fourth. So everything here is significant. And with that, I want to get back, and just round this off. And what I think you should do whenever you are studying, have the option, is to do maximum likelihood estimation. On this, you have an exact maximum likelihood if you have the option. And then if the calculation time is too long, then do the conditional sum of squares. Don't do the moment of estimates unless you're explicitly asked to do so. And then you say one important thing when doing all this modeling is that you have to find a model. You don't have to model the world. You have to model the problem that you're given and find a solution to the question. So keep in mind that essentially all models are wrong, but some are useful, to quote George Box. And that, I think, is very important all the way through. Don't expect that you can always find a perfect model. Find a model that is sufficiently good to what you're doing. Thank you.